Welcome to Lifelong Learning on ReachMD. I'm your host, Alicia Sutton, and we're broadcasting from the annual meeting of the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions. And actually, this is our opportunity to actually talk about the meeting itself. We've had great interviews with people who have presented here. And with me is Detri Solkis. He's the outgoing Alliance Board President, and he's the incoming Foundation President. So he's got great insights on what's ahead for the Alliance and a little bit of a recap on what we saw this this uh, week. Excellent. Glad to be here. Thank you for joining us. So... Um, What's your what's your overall kind of, you know perspective on on the agenda and where things are heading and uh, how it was addressed? So this year's focus was really on data and how we can use data to demonstrate our value and chart our course into the future. It's been a very positive meeting. The momentum's really on the upswing. We have uh, about 10% higher um, folks here this year than we had last year. Excellent. So a lot of interest, a lot of value, and a lot of value of education being demonstrated. That's excellent. Yeah, there were quite a few data presentations. I enjoyed them myself. Um, you want to recap uh, Jen Holbeck. She did, a, she did a great job. Yeah, she was one of the top TED speakers last year, and she gave us a really interesting presentation on curly fries and how it turns out folks who like curly fries on Facebook are actually the smartest people in America. Yeah. She said, why is that so? And she told a really interesting social network story for us all to really understand how social networks work. So what that means is that people that like a certain thing tend to be similar. So we, yeah. we hang out in networks on people that are like us, and we can learn things about our network's likes and dislikes, and it actually applies to healthcare as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she really did shed light on how these certain pieces of information, these little data nuggets that when you put them together give such a bigger story, which is important for educators. And also we can look in, at our patients and understand what, what they like and dislike and how that's going to predict what conditions they may have or how they'll respond to treatments. Right. And uh, Laura Adams, she did a great presentation. And today I was um, actually drawn to tears myself at listening to this woman's incredible presentation on how quality and patient safety issues really need to be improved and how she's been looking to get educators more involved in that effort for the past 10 to 15 years and really having a tough time and happy to have met our organization mm -hmm. to be able to enlist us in that same effort. Yeah, and, and give us, a, the listeners who were not there, give us a little bit of a detail on that story. So she's a nurse, and so she's been a healthcare practitioner her entire career, and she's noticed a lot of errors in the hospital and in healthcare clinics that have really impacted patients. So she's made it her lifelong goal to reduce those errors. And what she realizes is, is doctors don't even know you know, why these errors exist. She gave a story about how some orders had been transcribed six times by hand. So by the sixth time, of course, it wasn't quite accurate, mm -hmm. and a, a baby got the wrong dose of a medication and nearly died. Uh, yeah. So, And she herself was in medical care where she almost had the wrong procedure done upon her, which is just horrifying. It is horrifying. Yeah, she did some big stories on data and stories and how it impacts us. Uh, Murray Coppolo, he's a usual guest on uh, yes, your I, agenda. I've had the pleasure of knowing Murray about the last 15 years. He's been the 20-year-long CEO of the Accreditation Council for CME, and he's retiring this year. Yeah. So we got to have Murray to a, a send-off reception, and he also gave us a view for where he thinks education is going. And the, the main thing he left us with is that learning is changing. With the use of mobile and the access to instant answers on Google at all times, mm -hmm. He said, we don't necessarily need to test doctors on information. We need to test doctors on their application of information. It's always available to them, but are they using it the right way? Yeah. Did he focus on, I remember his topic was about the, you know, the future of medicine. Did he talk about um, the application of clinical practice changing because of education? Yeah, he sees a lot of quality benefits coming from this data being available at all times and also the, the treatment patterns being clearer. A lot of times you didn't know how that patient was treated six months ago, but now it's instantly available on the electronic medical record. No, oh, that's very interesting. So tell us a little bit about the Alliance and what's happening there and changes and improvements. And yeah, so the Alliance um, has really expanded its mission from just medical professionals to all health professionals. And what we're seeing at this meeting is actually the pharmacy educators come and join our meeting formally. We also have the nursing educators who have joined us as well. Mm -hmm. And the three of them are all here mainly because there's now something called joint accreditation mm -hmm. where one activity can apply to all three at the same time. Right. That's excellent. So that's part of the reason you've had an increase, obviously, in the number of attendees. It sure is. And different perspectives. I, the agenda looks very different this year. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of sessions that now talk about how the different professions work together rather than in their own silos. Yeah. And it's really groundbreaking work. It is. We've talked about collaboration for years. It's nice to see it 
in play here? Well, it's happening finally because of places like Thomas Jefferson that have interprofessional institutes where they've been studying this from 2007 on to show what a new paradigm looks like, where you have the team sitting down and formulating a plan together rather than just having a doctor writing orders and handing it to a nurse. Right, right. Um, how about the foundation? That's something you're now walking yourself into? Exactly. So the, the board president at the Alliance always goes into the past president year, which entails raising funds for the foundation. So I will be the foundation board president. And what we're trying to do this year is work really on this quality effort to bring education and quality together, like what Laura Adams was talking about earlier today, to make sure that educators are really focused on the outcomes of what happens after they educate. Right. Who are the who are the grants coming from um, on, the, on the foundation? Here? We've got a wide range from pharmaceutical companies to payers to the government, um, and even some of our providers themselves are contributing to the cause. No, it's terrific. We look for some interesting outcomes. Do you have some outcomes generated so far on that? We, we do. We do. Just yesterday, a press release went out on our roadmap to show how educators, how they can insert themselves more effectively into quality improvement. And we're about to engage on a Squire tool development, which helps educators then report on the outcomes. So once they've actually educated someone on quality, now they can report on it and get it published in the peer review literature. That's excellent, because I think the, the advocacy side sometimes is a little bit hard for the uh, individual companies, the individual members of the alliance, that they need a little bit of help on that. So it sounds like you're putting together some tools. So we did just uh, reestablish our advocacy committee this year, and one of their main goals is to create some templates on how these outcomes that show benefits to patients mm -hmm. can be publicized. Because we really just talked about it internally at our own meeting, but we need to tell the whole world about this. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I mean, our listeners are for the most part, medical professionals, um, and clearly they understand continuing education as a, a, not only a requirement, but a desire on their part. But there's a lot of people out there that do not understand this world at all. It's in the background, doesn't occur to them. They don't walk in and say to their physician, how many CME credits did you get last year? <laughs> you know, they don't, but do you see that changing? I do. I mean, it's interesting. I was with my wife at the dermatologist last week and we noticed their certificate for her dermatology degree had lapsed because she hadn't maintained her certification. And that's something that CME is used to do, is to maintain your certification. So I think the public will become more aware of this as we start to advocate more. Right, I think that's very true. Tell us a little bit more about the Quality Improvement Education Initiative, sort of the global initiative of the Alliance. So this initiative has 10 different building blocks that will help us get educators more aware of how to develop programs that make more sense for the quality peers within their local organizations. Because today, a lot of times, educators work in their own silo just with the, the medical professionals rather than actually working with their quality peers in the hospital mm -hmm. to make sure they really know where the gaps are. Because sometimes our medical education providers will just find a gap that they see in the public literature rather than locally in their institution. Because these quality folks, they're responsible for things like in-hospital infections, readmissions, and a lot of safety issues that educators can help with. Right. It's certainly harder now to develop <coughs> education that does prove that quality unless you're in a collaboration because not every company has access to that level of data. Absolutely. Those collaborations are more critical than ever. Yeah, you can see that happening. If you're just joining us, this is Lifelong Learning on ReachMD. And we are talking about the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions annual meeting, talking with Destry here. Um, any more changes that you kind of want to focus on and think about as people are leaving the conference or didn't have a chance to catch up on all of the sessions? Yeah, the, the new pr incoming president is Ed Dellert, a good friend of mine. He's a nurse by training, and his focus this year will be really on making sure that these members understand what's changing around them. Mm -hmm. Because so much has changed so quickly, these members haven't really recognized who even in my institution does quality. Right. You know, how do I find these people? How do I get more engaged with them? And then how do we partner together to launch programs? you know, in concert rather than separately in parallel. Right, yeah, we've had some great interviews with um, institutions that do clearly recognize it, great interviews with Chitra from Duke and talked to her in recent years too about bringing that QI in. It's hard for the physician on the phone or, so, or uh, listening online and doesn't have that access. You know, they have to think through different ways to access quality measures. And you know, what we're doing as, as part of this effort next year also is publicizing a lot of these metrics. Mm -hmm. So the first tool we're rolling out in our roadmap is called Squire, and it's really a quality improvement format for publication. And the first thing you have to do in the Squire tool is obtain the right quality metrics. 
So the National Quality Forum, the NCQA, and a lot of other national organizations validate these quality metrics, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that need to be used to actually identify where the gaps are and then measure how much we can close those gaps. Interesting. So this will help CME or CE providers uh, generate the generate an outcome from their data that people can look at, read, decipher. And, and even more so, as they start using this tool consistently within our organization, mm -hmm. we'll have a, a common format and common data sets that will drive a large registry of education. Mm -hmm. And this registry will allow us to do meta-analysis to show how education is actually impacting healthcare. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of big data around the corner. <laughs> what are the thoughts on uh, next year's conference? Um, I'm sure the creativity has already started. It sure has. It's actually going to be located in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. so we're very excited about that. And the theme next year will be um, not so much around data, but around the uses of data. So Interesting. Yeah. What are you thinking on that? The uses of it uh, through education and other ways? And the uses of it in terms of being available at all times, um, not just to the professionals, but also to the educators, mm -hmm. so that we can all be working off the same data set and be using it just kind of the way water flows through pipes, just use the data as, as if we expect it to always be there and, and not really do any kind of programming without it. Right. Is there anything that surprised you when you listened to people's Q&A this year that you thought, wow, we, we have changed, or, you know, we haven't changed much. I mean, <laughs> did, did anything that's jumped out at you? Well, it's a good question. It is our 40th anniversary, mm -hmm. and so we had a big past president's party. And so I got to hear from, actually, the, the father of the alliance, a, a gent named Lou Miller. Yeah. Um, we started this thing out in New York City back in 1975 when I was seven years old. And, and Lou's perspective um, is, is a very nice one because when they started, they really wanted to bring education to a new professional level. Back in 75, it was really kind of catch as catch can in the education world, and the alliance was formed to really train everyone on a consistent basis. And where he sees us now is really at an inflection point to do that again, to get more engaged with the top academic centers, with the government, um, with the top payers, to make sure that we're hearing what they really need from education and actually teaching them what they can actually get from education. Right. So we're about to embark on another big quality improvement education grant round um, really to be used to go get these folks around the table and to develop their views into our tools for our members. No, that's good. You mentioned government. Was there uh, a stronger government um, presence here this year? Um, it's slowly growing. We actually did have our um, most recent board election where we elected the VA CME director onto our board. Very nice. Her name's Diane Durham, and she actually controls CME for all 17 VA centers. Isn't that something? Pretty that will bring great, great information in. Pretty incredible, especially, yeah. I'm not sure if you saw the news yesterday, that Google and Price Waterhouse are applying for an EHR, um, I guess, grant mm -hmm. to develop a new Department of Defense EHR. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I don't think there's anything Google won't do. <laughs> it's coming along. So any key takeaways that you want to leave with uh, listeners on here and, and those who are unable to make it? I think the key takeaways here for me are that education really is starting to prove itself as being super valuable in the quality realm. Um, not enough people have done it yet to make, make it clear and ubiquitous to everybody. So we're laying the, you know, the groundwork, the roadmap, and now some tools so that all you know, 1,200 of the members who are here can start using these tools to demonstrate their value. Right. Um, are these going to be available on the website for the Alliance? They sure will. Okay. Any other resources you might recommend? Um, well, let's get that address out there. AC oh, the <laughs> ACEHP.org. Thank you very much. That's the Alliance's website. Any other resources you'd like to send people to to get more information about either QI, quality improvement, or any of these questions that we've, we've talked about? Yeah, there, there are a couple, actually. Thanks for asking. Um, the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, has a quality journal that they publish. So if you look up BMJ quality on Google, you can find a website that has the Squire tool I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So you can instantly go look and see how the Squire tool is published. You can also go to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement website, which has a plethora of resources in the quality sphere, too. That's good. Yeah, we talked to the uh, digital editor from the Journal for Continuing Education of the Health Professions. That was interesting to hear his perspectives on that as well. Well, we greatly appreciate your being here. Any final words for us? No, I'm just grateful that you let me get on the air with you all, and, and thanks, Alicia. Well, I was glad. And we should mention that this is a series that's co-produced with the Alliance, um, and we greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here as well and share the information with everybody. Wonderful. Take Thank care. Thank you so much for joining us. You've been watching Lifelong Learning on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. 
This series is co-produced with the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions. For more information and a full library of medical broadcasts, please visit ReachMD.com. And we look forward to having you join us again. Thank you so much. Thank you.